Long Body Prayers is an animist somatics ritual art project and graduate thesis. The first interview in this season, being in the awkward, longing for the slowness, listening for intimacy in a time of relationship betrayal, the conversation with Susan Raffo. Um, but the, this marsh, have you ever been to Bass Lake Marsh on the other side of Bidet Makoska? I have. Um, I used to live right by there mm. and I started walking every day um, and finding there's this little peninsula that's right by that. Um, I, uh, there's kind of like a, a therapeutic um, building that's there. Um, there's this little peninsula and there, there's a log and the turtles always hang out on the log. Um, and so I like, you know, would sit and watch them, um, but they'd often leave right when I came. And so my favorite part has been um, that I just, I love how they poke their heads out of the water. And I had, I just, because I'll sit there for a long time, I've kind of like developed a, you know, a listening for like, oh, that's a turtle all the way over. <laughs> And, and now it's, you know, now I, I moved away from there and now I'm, you know, and then there was another move and recently discovered another marsh that's right down the road. Um, and so I've been, you know, sitting there every day now. And it's interesting. It's like, I, I feel like they really, they really kind of attend to me when I'm when I'm there and when I'm talking to them, um, mm-hmm. that, that they're just there. These moments where they'll just poke their heads out and watch me. It's huge. I mean, I think just the level of mutual awareness as a form of medicine is huge. You know, as a body worker, I feel like a lot of what I do is just awareness of the way life is showing up in a body. And I think that it's the same. I mean, I'm just hearing you describe mutual awareness. I mean, you know, I'm on such a massively city street. I'm on 11th and Lake. Um, There's trash all over. It's a pretty hard time in this neighborhood. That's the energy's tight. And like, as I just extend, I mean, there are box elders, silver maples and linden trees right here. And just that feeling of mutual awareness of just, I'm aware of them, they're aware of me. And that's just regular, like it's just regular. You know, it's not even, when I say it's sacred, it's sacred the way that life is sacred, but it's not like sacred. (laughs) It's like, hey, hi, like, you know, and the gradations. I mean, I love that. I love, that's what I hear as you say the turtles. I mean, and I'm sure that they're used to our species largely going by without the connection of our awareness and it is it's why I say it's healing it is nourishing to have gentle non-forceful awareness a neutral loving awareness I think the next thing I'd like to do is just kind of call in some layers of beings Mm-hmm. Just acknowledge who's already with us and mm-hmm. just invite more explicit support. I'm excited to be led by you and to learn from you. So thank you for doing that. I think the, the first being who really comes up is Cottonwood. Mm-hmm. I, I know you shared you shared about cottonwood beings and there's there's one right by the river where I am who just there's there's something about their energy that just is majestic and deeply, deeply nurturing.
And then kind of noticing a, a belly being who, who, get, who is here often in the silence um, has kind of a flavor of that, that wild animal being that, that isn't sure if they're welcome by the fire or not. And also I'm really, I'm really noticing the rhythm shift um, and the difference in focus. Um, I'd love to, if you'd like to take a turn and call a couple of meetings in. I would happily do that, thank you. I also call in Cottonwood with so much gratitude, feeling the three large Cottonwood people just behind my back in the park, not far from here. And in particular in this time with Shante, Cottonwood's deep wisdom of what it means to grow together and to support each other when the ground is unstable, when the ground floods, when the ground is not certain. There's so much wisdom about how to stay erect. So I call that energy in, that gift, that wisdom. And then I also feel in and invite in, I feel wolf. I mean, I feel the way we are sniffing in the corners, right? Two mammals who are getting to know each other. And I feel like, I feel wolf puppy energy here with us, you know, inquisitive, curious, a little bit cautious, um, which feels different from elder wolf. Mm. Yeah, and I feel that in my face and in my heart and then between us and with us. It's lovely. Yeah. I'm gonna show you my actual, well, not actual wolf puppy, but wolf descended puppy. Um, <laughs> yes. <laughs> Yeah, I, I actually love to call in the energy of her and her her neighbor friend playing. They just every time I feel stuck or overwhelmed and I watch them play, there's just like my whole being kind of gets shaken up. Um, uh. Yeah, yeah, and there's just like they they. When they first started to play, um, when they first started to play together, uh, there was like, there was so much enthusiasm, and there was almost kind of a scarcity about it because they wouldn't be able to play very long. Um, one of them was attached to her leash; um, the other would come and visit. And then recently, we've been letting the other puppy into our yard. Um, and so they have enough time to like wildly play and then they'll pause and they'll just kind of hang out. Um, and then they'll like get into mischief together. They'll find like what the, they'll pick up wood chips or they'll, you know, find little stuffed animals. And there's something about just the different rhythms of how they are with each other that I really like. I love that. I think I explicitly want to just welcome and, and kind of meet my little one. And I imagine that there's also a little one in you. Um, like for me, my little one is, is very much not sure that she belongs um, and is not sure that it's welcome to yeah talk about things that she loves mm -hmm. and so just kind of just like want to just invite her in and just like hold her on my lap in this conversation welcome huge welcome i feel the um you know i i know the lineages that you've named that are defined in the times when we've had nation states and cultures we recognize. I really feel the presence of the river Danu 
which mm-hmm. is one of the origin points for the people who we now identify as different shapes and flavors of Europeanness. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, it's, it's, there's a lot I could say about it, but it was interesting that it showed up as we were talking. And so I got curious about like where our lineages might connect, you know, like 8,000 years ago, 10,000 years ago, um, at a time where belonging for our people was definitely not transactional and was as much about the land as it was about relationships. And so I'm remembering, and maybe it's because you also named marshes. My, I just felt a really clear yes, that there's some truth there, that that is a connect, um, that you named turtles. I feel turtle there and water there. <laughs> but mostly I f- feel it as in there, it just came in very quiet and very slow and very held power as a time of belonging where what I am hearing and feeling is that there are some parts of our different lines that knew each other then. And so I bring in the times where belonging was not so confusing for us individually and for us collectively. Mm. Yeah. I want to bring in an invitation for myself to not feel like I have to respond right away and to um, <laughs> if you haven't noticed by now, this whole thing is a giant practice of just how to relate in ways that mm-hmm. are more authentic and less hiding um, or that honor the hiding. Um, yeah, I want to I want to invoke that that journey downwards into the belly and the below the belly. Um, and, and deep into the earth where the mycelium lives in the root system and deeper to that place of the river beneath the river. And then deeper than that to, to what I've met as, as first stone is this place where Yeah, this place where just like the ground is really solid and present. The one more thing I will bring in is I bring in and welcome your and my awkwardness and fumbliness, gloriously so. And I'm really pulled again by the trees outside my window who, because of the drought, the leaves started to burn and then it rained. So the leaves are still reaching, but they're reaching with with parts of them that can't reach right now, right? Because they're holding, they're holding the impact of we had six weeks without any rain and high, 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 high temperatures. You know, so there's an awkward fumbliness about their photosynthesis right now, you know, because they have less surface area than what they usually have. They're curled, but they're, you know, they're just impacted. So I just welcome, you know, and I feel that in like wolf puppy in the trees outside, just awkwardness and fumbliness and not being afraid to be silly in the midst of the sacred. And you, specifically you, Shante, as well as myself, but just the truth of who we're going to be on this call. Welcome awkwardness. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And welcome weirdness, too. Yes. Welcome the, like, the parts that are like, okay. <laughs> yeah. Another friend that I have has um, kind of started to collect. <laughs> Will you tell me about the, the artwork that is on your wall? Absolutely. Um, this was a gift from a beloved of mine whose name is Arna. And she just, it's a 
uh, the page of an old dictionary, I'm guessing from the way it looks, maybe 1920s, 1930s, just because the typeface. And then it's a block print of a heart and lungs and esophagus. Um, and again, an old anatomical print. Um, and she gave it to me and I put it on this wall. I'm, right now I'm sitting in um, my, my partner's bedroom and I'm in a corner that has a comfy chair, a lamp, et cetera. So during pandemic times, it's, I created this so that I had a place to do my work that, you know, we have a small apartment so I could close my door and have some privacy. Um, and this was already on the wall when I did that. And so as we have continued to live in this time where how we breathe together for so many reasons is either awkward or uncertain or compromised, how we feel and know our own hearts individually and collectively is the same, is it just feels super good that it is there at my shoulder, visible to who I'm with when I'm on screen like this. And that it's a gift from somebody who loves and knows me. Welcoming heart, welcoming lungs and welcoming esophagus. Yeah. Tight and loose. Yes. Yeah. And welcoming grief. Like I, I've kind of already think in, in both of us I've just met as we've been writing these like layers of these big bodies that move through our little bodies and Yes. And then this is um, this is Kaliak, um, who is a I think Celtic um, kind of grandmother being. Um, the story that she's the one who gathers the bones in the middle of winter and puts them in the cauldron and sings over them and heats them and then they become a wolf again or a woman again. Oh wow! And, and so she's kind of she's. Um, Kind of here is the the great 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 grandmothers and the that that cauldron that that feeling of container. Mm. Oh, that's fascinating. That what I felt was the edge of the overwhelm of to of of that which is almost unable to be held and felt. Yeah. Well, and it when I after this happens sometimes in my my art after I made her I noticed this being here. Yes. It feels like a, a, a baby, maybe even still in the womb. Um, and and that, that energy that I've been noticing of kind of this, this abandonment. Mm. I, the big word phrase that I've been playing, this might be, this might be from being German and the putting together of words. <laughs> Ancestral abandonment pain body has been this phrase that's come through for that. It's beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. So she like, she, she's a, she feels like a really good protector. Um, and she was the last person I put on the wall. And when I did, I was suddenly like, okay, that's. <laughs> Thank you for introducing me to you through also your creation. Thank you for, for watching and, and meeting me here. Like noticing some heat in my back. Um, and noticing like a little more settling coming down my spine to my tailbone. Mm -hmm. There's like, there's more space to breathe, yeah, and then there's some heat off of my back. <laughs> <laughs> and I just, this, you know, I, I saw that image on Facebook too, a while ago, and she just kind of kept coming back. I love it so. Mm. And as I, as I'm with it more, and thinking, you know, it, it's 10,000 years of different movements. And I was thinking that, you know, I, I 
I believe the Dakota people have been here for at least probably much more than 10,000 years. And so there's, there's something also about relationship to land and water that moves and what it means to, to be in that adaptation. Yeah. And for me, that I think I, I spoke about it in the video, but the metaphor of what happens when the river is then constrained to a single. Absolutely. And the houses are built with steel and cement and expected to never move. So this is, this is both Wabash, uh, Mississippi water, um, and also from right near Bedote. It's um, beautiful. And I realize in the welcoming, I, I would like to also welcome the Dakota people, the Anishinaabe people, all of the indigenous people who live here and tend this place. It was an earlier conversation that I had with the river. Um, as I was kind of in this question about contact, which for me is like, you know, what it what is what is in between relationship between me and the earth? You know, what what's in that space for my kin, um, for our kin. Mm -hmm. And I ended up just in this kind of glorious play of my, my bare feet in the mud right on the riverbank. And these, these words, so I, I kind of play with like listening and channeling and, and what wants to come through from the land. Um, and these words about that place of not avoiding harm, but, but meeting, meeting discomfort, meeting, meeting everything with that contact in such a way that you can choose what the response is. Um, Yeah, and there's like something as I'm talking about it, I'm like feeling a little tightening in my belly. And there really, there really is something I think about. That's like, what is the space for agency for, for our kin? And that, how the, how the river is actually in contact with the banks and the obstacles, you know, the obstructions and the flow, and that what containment and permission and support is necessary to start that dance again of mm -hmm. this is the moment. This is you, this is me. And and that that navigating of response. Why does the dance have to wait? What do you think the dance is? I think we're in it right now. Um, for me, that's a good question and a big question. Um, I think for me and my shaping, there, I 
Yeah, whatever's there, it's okay to not know too. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 Yeah, I think it's fear of heartbreak. And something even deeper than that. And something in my own, my own kind of healing or coming back into body has been a lot about just letting my, like actually feeling that I exist and a very different quality of being that that's about that, that navigation of the present moment. Which in my system, like it has to do with, with container that has space around it and enough of a feeling of being held that I can really drop deeper um, but like held held with spaciousness Are you okay if I listen to what you said and do a little bit of a question shift yeah. in what you just said with the recognition as you and I are learning each other? For me, this is so not, but there's a right way or wrong way. Like we are deeply listening to each other and I am listening to you express your life, express what makes sense. And I don't just mean that in a mental body way. I mean that in a belly way too, in the moment. And as I just heard you say something that was about, you know, here is support or connect, here's that that being held, and here's where you are, you know, it is in separate things. I got curious because I'm like, often when I think not just about our people, but I guess our species with, you know, specifically our people within it, because that's what I know best, is that I believe that we are held like all of the time. And the question that I'm, you know, that comes for me is not how are we held and more what gets in the way of being able to feel the fact that we are held right now. Yeah. You know, and I think that there's so much of the wound of our people. And I know that you're not completely Christian, but certainly the wound of Christian supremacy for those who are not Christian is this idea that, you know, I mean, you know this, that we do all the right things. And then even if things are shitty right now, on the other side is heaven, right? It's this thing where all the crappiness is gone and we have unconditional belonging, safety and love in ways that we never could have imagined before, as opposed to it's available right now, like it's here right now. And then what are the things that are that are in the way, you know? And so even like, I love the river, right? The image of the river, because it's just that image so beautifully shows what it means to be held and to belong in such a way that when you are overwhelmed, you actually break your banks because there's just not enough space. And then on the other side, when you come back, you don't come back in the same place anymore. But there's no question of being held, like the earth is still there. There's still a place for the river to move. Um, you know, and it's whatever it means to know, the river knows that. Um, and the river gets overwhelmed and the river can't fill up its own bank sometimes because not, it's not big enough. Um, But the hold is always there. And it makes me remember that the glory of our ancestors gave us that after we leave the first world, which is fluid into the world of earth and air on the other side of birth is the very first reflex we have is the reflex that enables us to feel, relax into gravity and still be able to move. So it is the first reflex that is about essential grounded support that is always there, which is gravity and our capacity to move within it, which has layers. Those are the primitive reflexes that help us to build that, you know, and the oak tree has those same primitive reflexes and so does the salamander. And I love that. It's like, it's just there. And then there's the wound.
And I love with what you're doing with this. It helped to have the second writing when you said, oh, I didn't actually tell you about myself. I was like, oh, this is so beautifully, which I think is part of exactly what you're saying. Like, when do I bring in this? How do I show myself to you? What is intimacy like? What is between us as opposed to me separate together? I mean, I honor deeply the practice that you're in, Shante. You know, and when you just said this practice is, it, it's about relationship, connection with other humans. You know, we're the fucking hardest ones for each other. Because <laughs> we, you know, because we're the ones where there's betrayal between us. So much relationship betrayal um, within our own lives and generationally. And so I just honor how you're sitting in the, the awkward fumblingness of how do we do this? And at the same time, what's the practice of feeling the relationship that is here, even between two awkward people who don't quite know how to find each other, you know? Yeah. Hi, real person. <laughs> Hello, other real person. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Yeah, there's something about like bringing that that part which is attuned to that wider body and mm. that those deeper rhythms and what what I call ritual. Um, I I really have this sense of that that part of the fragmentation of our kin like has been the the time when that had to had to be hidden and go inward and it wasn't safe to have that that webbing of relationship with other human kin mm -hmm. and there's like there's a huge paradox um i see differently in different you know different people i'm learning from um around that that regrowing or that remembering of of the contact that's already there. Like the, the necessity of, of co-regulation and coherence, you know, have it, like meeting meeting other coherent nervous systems who can can be that container in that regrowing process. Mm -hmm. um, but then the paradox of then when that's that's where the wound has taken place. Mm -hmm. um, like for me, I think what I'm in is is like how do how do I let myself be eldered? How do I let myself actually show up mm -hmm. in that relationship and not not outsource my authority or you know be out of my center? Mm -hmm. Because the way I am seen and the questions that I ask are going to be very different, and I. I think I think sort of my orientation to my work and this project has been a noticing that I don't really see that talked about. The particular pattern that my system has, which I, I recognize also in friends and in other people. Um, and I'm not quite sure I'm not quite sure why that's still not talked about or kind of underneath things. Um, I mean, people call it like a fawn response, you know, or, or um, but there's something there which lives in that space you've talked about as relationship betrayal that feels so essential. And it kind of, you know, it, it's like, I mean, the, the reason that I went to workshops for years and would do like a, you know, weekend thing and, and become vulnerable with people in that way was so I could kind of avoid having to do this. So I could avoid like the actual yes. steps towards intimacy. Yes. And I do, I have, I have a knowing that it's like, it's in those, it's in that this actual kind of navigation and awkwardness and descent that capacity is actually grown where you're not you're not just stepping into someone else's container yes getting an experience that's actually out of your 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 present capacity and then going back to life and kind of trying to find how to integrate that taste yes 
but it's that that navigation is where where things start to actually mm -hmm. I think this is where you and I, um, and I, I wrote about this, that we are shaped and we spend probably a bunch of our time in different communities. Yeah. Um, have I ever told you the story about, I'm going to tell a story and then come forward to be with what you just said. Mm -hmm. um, and I might have told you this. So if I did interrupt, unless you want it for the purpose of this. In the 80s, I lived in England for seven years um, and was involved in all kinds of different work. And I've always been I came in through the door that was more about what gets called political work um, than spiritual work. And right, the wound in the West is that it separates them as though they're different. And so I was doing a lot of environmental justice work and I was invited to a community in Scotland called Findhorn. And Findhorn brought in people who were environmentally justice focused, organizers, activists, who were doing all different kinds of, of work on behalf of our kin, planet, used all different language for that. Some that was more animist, some that was not. And then people who were doing what was called in the eighties earth spiritual work. Um, and they were very, very separate communities as I think they often still are, although they're much closer and more overlapped in places amongst our kin they were than they have been before. Of course, indigenous folks, they've always been overlapped, but amongst our kin. So they brought us up to build relationship and to come together. And the, from, my under, from my observation, the folks who came in who were political folks, the distance between our political work and doing spiritual work was not huge because many folks were drawn to political work because they fucking love the planet because of the relationship they had with an oak tree as a child. And so out of this, they had a desire to fight. So there are, even though they didn't have ceremonial practice, ritual, culture, it was in their bodies and in the field. Um, and so it wasn't a hard gap. For the people who are coming in through earth spiritual work, it was really difficult for many of them to talk directly about power and about impact. And it became so difficult that a lot of the people who came in through organizing activist lens just left because they were like, I am so happy to be here to open up, to get raw and vulnerable with you. But I also need us to have these really direct conversations about the power that is here between us, you know, about what as humans we do to each other, not just about how we connect with other than humans. We used different language in the eighties. Um, and I ended up staying through the whole time because I wanted to experience all of the stuff that was there. Um, but I just remember this sadness about an inability, you know, to, to tell the truth about power. You know, and I think the, um, I don't know if I fully understand what you're saying, but what arose in my body as I listened to you is, um, and it's what I read, felt as I read your words, as you so beautifully articulated the, um, the truth of conditional belonging and what it brings up is this desire for unconditional belonging, for a sense of beingness of connection that's not always comfortable that's not always in harmony and pretty but is just irrefutable you know and what that brings is a kind of a and uh, an unsteadiness you know and usually when I do body-based stuff I'm often asking people to feel sort of like even for you and I right now like what is the quality of connection you feel to me you know do you notice in your body right now that there's a kind of a leaning towards me, that reach feeling? Is there a pullback? Are you in your center? And if you're in your center, is it a fluid, pleasurable center or is it a tight, frozen center? You know, and to notice those states of being, the quality of connection that we feel, because our people are usually, our kin are usually either this or this or this but very rarely this. And you and I have already been born and we're already older than nine years old. So to some degree, we're already shaped, which is why this is generational work. So I, I hear your question. I'm like, yeah, the glory is what are the layers that we can soften, the things we can learn for ourselves, but really to shift the field for three generations from now so that those children three generations from now are born in and their first nine years of shaping means that they are different than probably you and I will ever be even as we will be different than who we were born to be because of our commitments. 
so I know that in the what gets called political worlds I'm a part of, that interrogation about power between us, which on good days is transformational. On bad days is crappy as shit. You know, it is all about like other kinds of rules and dogmas. Um, that that is, there's a, there's a, there's gorgeous conversation in the same way that is the closer I get to, and it's where some of the places I've been confused about some of your language, because you're in communities I'm not in. And so I'm like, oh, I believe in those communities. There's also like the edge that is transformational and glory, the medicine for all of us. And the edge that is, you know, what I often see is um, an inability to sit in the place of repair and power. Yeah. You know, to really embody that without protection, with a clear sense of one's own connected dignity, safety, and belonging, like that in trust that says, I can tell you the story without flinching away or looking for you to make me feel okay about what my people have done and how I sit in the truth of that story and how I can bring that into a relationship with you. Like that is, um, you know, you've heard me say, it's like, I believe our work, our kin is to do both repair and remembering at the same time and to not do them separately. And within there, it's like, that's where it's like, I love you brought your little in because your little and my little, I hate the word deserved in English and I don't, there is no other word. You know, what our ancestors knew and how they grieve for us is that all children, what is the non-English should? English is so not the useful language in these moments, you know, but the ancestors dreamed us to belong to the past, the present and the future. And our kin as children don't. Yeah. None of us, even those of us who are parented really well and live in communities. Like this is there's generations before and before we know how to be in cross-generational relationships. Like I'm 58, you know, people are turning to me saying, you know shit. And I'm like, I don't know how to do this any more than anybody else does. But I'm not afraid of making mistakes and being awkward. So like, let's learn together which is the gift of what you're doing with this process. Mm -hmm. <laughs> There's like now an entire spider web of different potential paths available. Um, Yeah, it's a really big knotty tangle. This like this thing that that sits in that place between us and belonging. Um, yeah. How is your center right now? I'm remembering what you wrote me, so I want to check that before you respond. Yeah. I just noticed something come like up into my throat. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, and I'm noticing my my pelvis and my low body kind of a little bit harder now. And you are welcome, even as this. Like, you don't have to change it. Thank you for telling me what's true. There's almost, there's like a question about just like, like that, that ancestral abandonment, pain, body, grief being mm -hmm. is for me, for my system, it often feels like it's in the way of everything. <sighs> or that in landing deeper into intimacy, especially, I mean, like, especially mostly around power and around like, people who are older than me or people who are like more skilled, mm -hmm. um, have, you know, have been in that process of developing coherence. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. Mm. Oh, so I'm actually, I'm gonna try and just, let's see. Nope, not gonna do that. <laughs> Can I ask you a question while you're feeling? Yeah. Yeah. So what's it like to hear yourself say what you just said? I noticed there's this, literally this like gripping in my throat. Yeah. Like talking about the esophagus. Yeah. And what does it feel like to notice that that is there? Scary. Mm. Yeah, and then I feel the space behind my heart start to ache. Mm. Wow, I'm not... yeah, and then suddenly there's an opening and more breath. <sighs> this energy that comes up. I'm going to speak. Go ahead, please. No use. You stay with what's happening. I just wanted to say, I can't remember who it was. I was talking with a friend recently about the need to be uh, comprehensible, the need to be comprehensible, just the person you're with and how that often gets in the way of actually not knowing together or letting something come in that isn't. S super astute. Yeah. What were you gonna say? I'm gonna say one thing first with what you just said and the other. You know, it's, this is some stuff I've written about before. It just hits me so hard that all the different ways that the wounds of our kin show up, you know, that a primary linguistics idea about why we even have language is to communicate with each other. And of course that sets up such a funky power thing because it's what you just said. If I languaged in order to communicate with you, then that means you will determine if I've successfully communicated with you. So it takes the power out of my body as opposed to what was a radical edge in linguistics, but is starting to move forward, is that we are in the same way that a plant is, is that when a plant puts out a flower, you know, it is a communication to pollinators, to the world, I am here, but it's not sitting there going, oh my God, which kind of flower is going to attract the bee right now, et cetera, et cetera, over a long period of time, flowers will change you know, to sort of respond to the world around, but it's not this constant anxiety. It's just this back and forth impact, right? And so, you know, what it, like, those linguists say is that we actually communicate to express ourselves, period, from our dignity, from our the way aliveness, you know, fills our body and moves through. And then we express, and then we learn based upon what comes back and that shapes another expression, but it's not that I'm, speaking to communicate where you hold the power instead i'm speaking to express and then if you and i you know if you're like okay whatever i don't feel any sense of connection to what you said so i'm going to leave right now well there's learning for me right now i might or might not choose to change my expression or i might go express myself in a different room like that's my agency and autonomy and then in terms of the generational piece is that what is true, you know, there's a story that might you might have heard me tell before, because I've told it the Amankara group. One of my teachers, Marcy Rendon, who is an Ojibwe elder in, in Minneapolis and a beloved to me, she says that um, as we grow, 
we have experiences that we put like stones in our pockets. Like we have an experience as another stone in our pocket, another experience. And the energy of youth is like, oh my, oh, it's just amazing. Like so much newness, we filling our pockets. And then there's a point where we reach an age where the direction starts to turn. And all of a sudden, what we really want to do is share the stones in our pockets. Like, oh, look at this, look at this, look at this. And then if we're lucky enough to live our entire lifespan, then we reach the point where our, pox are, our pockets are empty and then it's time to go. And so what's different about where you and I are, you know, and of course, when we're young, there's things we want to share. And when we're older, there's new experiences. But the old, the younger we are, it's all new. And the older we are, it's almost, it's mostly emptying, you know, and you and I are in different places in the filling our pockets and emptying our pockets energies, right? And so if you and I meet in the world, if I'm somebody who's in a emptying my pocket place, then I'm like, oh, Shante, I'm seeing how life is coming through you. And there's things I've learned. Can I share a stone with you? Like here, let me share what I've been learning and what I see, because it helps me to be developmentally, generationally in alignment with my purpose. And you in that moment get to be like, oh, kick ass stone, bring it in. <laughs> it's really helping me. Then you're in alignment with your purpose, right? The why I, in the writing, I said, I think that's the reason why I'm so, it's so important to me to be in relationship with folks who I can also run into in the park. Um, I did national work for years and I still do with my writing, but beyond that, I haven't as much because I'm like, I'm good with words. Like I can pretty much tell stories where I like look like the biggest, grooviest person, you know, all this kind of stuff because I'm good with words, but I wanted to be in a place where folks were like, is she actually li living the words that she's saying? Um, because that is where magic that is earth rooted dangerously can turn into glamour. And I am, you know, I had a teacher say to me many years ago, Rafo, you are really good at glamour and there's not nearly enough root in your magic. You've got to, otherwise you're dangerous. And that's the, one of the best things anybody ever said to me. It was, I was offended and angry and hurt and all those things. It took me a bunch of time to be able to receive them as a gift, but they're now a deep gift. Um, Cause I love, I loved what you shared about being able to walk, walk to the people you love mm -hmm. and the deep relationship to the land. Mm -hmm. um, and there, I mean, there's even something in that, like about, uh, have you read the book Sand Talk by Tyson? Love it. He talks about supply chains. And I, what I hear in your words is like this, this, how to actually allow relationship around survival instead of outsourcing it beyond like what can be relational. Mm -hmm. um, so I think the idea of an existential territory is is those those pockets or bubbles of of place um, that that are starting to to bring in what's the other there's there's a concept in permaculture of you go you go to the place where there's there's already some beauty and there's already some some coherence yes out from there ah that's helpful. So I'm happy to reflect. And as I'm reflecting, um, what I would love is for you to notice, because it really matters to me, if my reflection is touching the place in you that was moved by the listening to existential territory, and to notice if it's in a different place, not out of a communication means that we are understood rigidity, but more of a really a belly curiosity. Um, I love, it's what I wrote, and I said so much heart curiosity as we navigate these things that are all the same thing. And it's what you see me and Kara do at Amankara, but that the language and shaping around it is different enough that it's like a couple degrees. So I'm super excited um, for you to listen as I talk and notice what comes up in you. I mean, first I have to say that I am somebody, you know, I was thinking about you telling the story of, of really growing up alone, you know, deeply alone. Um, and I grew up because my family was poor, didn't have a lot of cash. And that because by the time I was nine, I had experienced the death of my father, my brother, my sister, and a good friend being killed on the street because I had experienced a lot of death. 
And my mother was really depressed and, and her body had been really harmed. So she wasn't able to care for us. Is that there was a lot of emotional and spiritual aloneness. You know, I don't count the Catholic Church as spiritual connectedness. And at the same time, there was so much collective infrastructure, you know, because nobody had any money. And so how we were safe was that whoever had money cooked big meals and people went and lived there, you know, ate at their house. And there was just this, you know, working class web of practical relationship, you know, and um, that wasn't just with family of blood and bone, was also with neighbors in different ways. And it was also the 1960s, you know, where I used to say you'd come home from school and um, I never knew who was sitting at the kitchen table talking. It could be somebody, because so because organizing as people going door to door and talking about this thing that was happening or that thing that was happening, you know, it was very, very much there. I mean, I remember my neighborhood when, um, um, Dr. King was murdered. I was five. I remember when Malcolm X was murdered. You know, it's like those things impacted the neighborhood and people talked to each other. They were in each other. So there was a real um, different, you know, I think it still exists in 2021 in immigrant communities um, to some degree in rural communities, but things like the internet, like um, privatization that has been huge since the 80s has really shaped how that happens. But that's my normal and it's what I long for. Um, I never went through an assimilation process, even as I got education that other parts of my family didn't have. That was always a value for me is that um, community is not necessarily always about the people you would choose, but it is about the people whose lives are intertwined with yours in a practical way. Right. And then as I became politicized and acculturated and began to shape and change, um, one of the things that Sherry Mitchell, who is all who is Algonquin talks about is that um, is that some of the roots of belonging is that for what some of the wound of belonging is that for many of us in order to feel safe, we have to leave our family of origin to get experiences and learnings that our family of origin doesn't have. And in doing that, to find a sense of safety in our own dignity, we end up compromising an element of our belonging, you know? So I, so I did that. I left in order to find things, but that practical truth of, of community not being about choice was always there in the background, even while I was deeply invested in my right to have a choice, right to come out as queer, to experience the world differently than some of the ways my family raised me to experience the world, um, to drop out of school when my whole family was like, oh my God, you're gonna be okay because you're going to college. I was like, I hate this. So I dropped out, you know, all of these things. Um, still that piece. And it felt like a split in me for a lot of years where I would have the family that was like, or the people who were like the folks who would show up at two in the morning if there was a bat in our house, right? Or once I had a kid, my partner and I had a kid would show up around having a kid like those folks. And then the folks who were like super aligned spiritually, politically, where half the time they weren't even in walking distance for me, but like they had pieces of my heart that were flung all over. And it was having a kid in parenting where I was like, oh my God, like what the fuck am I calling community? Like I have so much community where we are aligned, we can hold space for each other, but everybody's in there, including me, we're all in our, you know, ego defined communities. Like, here's what I need for myself to be well. Here's what I need for myself to be well. Here's, and that's part of healing, right? But then in this moment, you know, and this has really happened in the cities that we live in. I mean, when George Floyd was murdered and watching what happened during the uprising is folks are like, are you my community? Like, who's in my pod? How do I stay safe? You know, all of those kinds of questions lifted is that as I got older, that early shaping around you know, who is there to help you keep stay safe and connected in the most material way? You know, even if you don't always like each other and you're not fully aligned because people shift and change, who is there? Like that centering for me became more and more important. And with work, you know, as something where I gain a lot of social capital because I use pretty words, because I know how to hold space in a way in which people feel safer than they did before they came into the space. Like those things really give me social capital, which is dangerous, you know? And 
And I, I feel surrounded by culture that has been crafted by people with a lot of really high social capital, but very shallow roots. And I think that's part of the wound of our kin, you know, is that we've so privileged. It's what um, Elder Albert Marshall, who is Mi'kmaq calls frontier mentality, you know, is that we've been able to create frontiers, not just the land, but like these ideas we have, these abstractions that we have, and then we pull people to them, you know, to sort of market it before, without even knowing them. And, um, and I realized I wanted whatever was happening to be happening in relationship to people who could call me on my shit, you know, and that often the folks who I was less aligned with politically and culturally were the ones most likely to call me on my shit because I couldn't glamour them, right? Because, you know, it's like my pretty use of pretty words. They were like, I don't really care about your pretty words. Like, are you showing up, you know? And, and my value, the value I give to that was higher and higher. And so all of, you know, the dream that I was writing about, which I wrote you, which feels like it's what emerged as I sit here going, I look left and right, Shante, and there aren't a lot of people in their 60s and 70s and 80s who are in community with younger people who are building and shaping culture in the way of youth, right? Um, is that the disconnect is huge between, for all the, these different ways that are make sense to me the older I get, but are also a deep wound. So as I sat there and I just kept praying, I was like, how do I get to be my age? but where I don't have to shape myself to a younger culture in order to belong with people who are younger, where a lot of the more exciting shit's happening. You know, how do I get to be the age that I am and be a relationship? And it's that dream that kept showing up of a place, you know, where there's a front door code, come on in. And what I love, what a practice so bad, Shante, is like if you were to walk in because you were feeling vulnerable and it was a hard fucking day and sad and, and you had that like reach, that desire to be met and you came in and we like get to be in practice. Like maybe I'm having a hard day, you know, maybe I'm upstairs with a today I'm not available sign on the door. You know, or maybe it's a day where there's three other people who show up with the same thing. How do we hold that together? Like, that's the practice I want to be in. Because then it's not about each unique incident. Like, here I am. I have to remember again that I trust you. Time goes by. I see you again. I have to remember again that I trust you. Time goes by. I have to remember again that I trust This constant vigilance of each other. Like, do I trust you? Are you showing up? I want to be in the practice that says, you know, here we are, real people. I see you. Today's the day. Today's not the day. We're going to be in practice around that being true. Like, well, it's exactly what you said. What is the line between we always show up out of a sense of duty that disappears our own individual needs versus the other extreme is we center our individual needs in such a way that people can't totally trust us to show up for them. You know, and the, the last piece I'll say, which is part of this is, um, I think you, you, you knew about the People's Movement Center, right? Uh, yep. So as part of the People's Movement Center, we closed. And one of the insights in our closing that a number of us had is that the PMC did a really good job of supporting people to listen to their rhythms and to make choices based on those rhythms, like a really great job. So if anybody said, it's too heavy for me today, I need to go home. Like we honored that. What that meant is that we could not build something collectively because people were so busy listening to their individual self and taking care is that there wasn't the, and so suspicious of override, like I don't wanna override, is that we didn't have the other like, oh, I'm actually in this because this can't move forward without me. And because I've made a commitment and so I'm still here, even though I'm exhausted, because the collective is enough to hold me. Like we didn't have that. And so we kept going to the two ends, either following my internal rhythms or overriding my rhythms and feeling resentment, right? It's the middle place of safety, belonging, and dignity is one that wasn't there enough. And so if I were to be starting the PMC now, I would start it differently. 
you know, there'd be other conversations in the same way that as a parent with a 19 year old, if I were starting right now with parenting, there's so much stuff I would do differently. And I think I was a good parent because I learned from it. So I'm not sure if this touches what you asked for as you talked about existential territory, um, but that is the story that I heard in response to your question. Hi. Hi. <laughs> So I'm, as much as anything, more than what needs to happen is that, because I can, I can, I use a lot of words, my friend, is I'm just checking to see how connected you feel to them, to me, to us right now. Noticing like kind of a wave of tingling coming in. Um, yeah. yeah it's interesting because it's like it's a very different way of talking um the tingling is the um your words we have different words don't we we do have different i think i mean i know I, when you were in the the recording on impact there was something about it that just like, I, I just like really drew me in. Um, and I realized my, my system seems to have, have difficulty with um, I, I mean, I guess it, I think also has to do with that trust process and that landing process. And, yes. Yeah. Yeah. And I feel no less close to you because of that. Thank you for telling me what's true. And what's interesting, Shante, is that right now I'm just talking to you as Susan, who you would meet in the park. If we were doing this as ceremony, mm. then how those words would come through would be different. Yeah, I think that's a lot of a lot of what the longing is. Mm -hmm. There's a lot about pacing too. There's a lot about all of the pauses and all of the the moments of navigation and listening. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I just got hungry also, so I had my, my apples and my cheese, and now my dog is eating an apple underneath me, so there's little munchings. Thank you for, for being here in the, like, I, also, I probably should have said this before, but you're the first person I've interviewed. <laughs> Interview, you know, whatever this, this strange experiment of not knowing what's going to happen is. Um, so I'm really grateful um, <sighs> and just a word that's underneath grateful for, um, for the way that you have, have been with all of the textures today. I'm sitting with some, you know, it was really helpful just to see what you just, what just happened it was beautiful. The clarity of, you know, yep, yeah, here's, if you ask me a question, you meet me in the park, here's how Susan would be, here's ceremony. And then your clarity of longing for the spaces and the pauses. I'm also thinking of what this practice is, which is about practicing, listening for relationship intimacy, right? And I wanna honor two things, right? One is we create the conditions for ceremony. I mean, I believe all life is ceremony, but 
even outside of capitalism, right? We have busy times where we're getting the food ready, where we're just gossiping. Like we still gossip, we still just talk to each other. And then there are the times where we come together and it slows and we have shared focus and we move at the speed of trust. We move at the speed of the slowest among us. And those are deeply important times. And intimacy has both. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that the speed of the slowest among us. Like, I mean, kind of going back to the turtle. Um, I sometimes feel like I'm a representative of, of that that longing for slowness in a way that often like feels like too much for for spaces you know with more dynamics and um, and I'm learning I'm learning that I'm learning about the beauty of shaking it up and different pacing also but you know that that integrating of the personal and the collective or what the collective organism needs. Mm. Mm. So I'm feeling right now the other dimensions where we've had different versions of these conversations where we started in the same place, but we ended up in different places. Yeah. And so I'm just bringing in, as we start nearing the end, I am bringing in those dimensions where we moved only at the speed that would have kept you feeling deeply connected to us. I think what I'd love um, is if you would drop into your ceremony place, which you are already. Um, would you speak about that I guess, I guess whatever question comes up for you or whatever, just drop into that place and listen and whatever wants to be shared from there, I would love to hear. So even before you asked me, Shante, what I was starting to feel, because I was slowing down and just listening and listening more than speaking. And I was feeling, which I'm feeling now, the sort of collective agitation that we are in. Right? And not as like a bad or a good thing, it's something that just is. And it is beautifully expressed by her agitation. Right <laughs> yeah, that was pretty perfect. I'm like, let's it drop really into was. ceremony. Ruff, ruff. No, that is what I was feeling. It's the, it, the agitation. It's such a gift for her to be expressing it. Yeah, I am feeling a lot. I'm noticing it. I see lines of red and silver. I hear a tightness in the leaves outside, particularly the silver maple, that brown edge I told you about, and that pull in, it's really strong. It's like a high-pitched wine in my ear, crinkly wine. When I was up north in Minnesota with um, a friend of mine who is Seneca Anishinaabe, she's a teacher and elder. Um, she does a lot with Little Earth here. She, uh, one of the things that she does is she spends time 
listening to elders in the North, most of whom only speak Ojibwe, and listening to their stories, and then bringing their stories back to the city and telling them to young Anishinaabe children who can't get up North, you know, but as, and she also, as she moves, she will like meet a community of salamanders in one place. And then with permission and ceremony, she'll bring one to another community of salamanders because of the way that our people have impacted the land. Genetic diversity is very difficult for some of the smaller, um, more isolated species. And so she's doing that, whether it is the stories and the language for the Anishinaabe people, for her people, whether it is for salamanders, whether it is for trees, whatever it is. And we were walking and she was showing me um, how, I, how the birches, uh, the birch trees were hurting, you know, and, and, you know, when I first showed up, I was like, oh my God, they're so beautiful. It's a gorgeous birch grove because um, I couldn't see. And she was showing me the wounds in the tree and how that shows up so that in, I just suddenly felt the tightness of breath, like what it means for the birch to be in distress. And I feel it in my chest. Um, and at that point I said to her, um, is there something we can do? It was like one of those instinctive reactive comments. My brain was not at all involved. And I said, um, you know, there's prairie restoration is there something we can do for the birch, you know? She looked at me, she just kind of laughed and she's like, ah, Susan, colonizer mentality right there. It's like, you know, it is arrogance to be a single species and to, to be a single person and a single species and to look at a, the impact of a complexity of factors and to believe that you would have an idea about how to change it or that your idea would be one that birch or moss or beaver wants. She's like, you know, our role is to listen and then listening is to wait. And we will know because that kind of knowing is different from any other kind of knowing. We will know when there is an action to take. And if we do not know in that way, then there is no action, which often includes feeling the distress without attempting to control it. So, you know, and as she was talking, I felt what I feel every time I tell this story, <clears throat> like something deep open up inside that helps me to remember. And then we walked a little bit further and we left the birch and we were in a marsh. And there was uh, something on the path. And she exclaimed in Ojibwe and she started praying and she knelt down and she offered a sema, she offered tobacco and, and then she picked it. And when she was done, she picked it up and she said, um, there is a, a, a water lily that is native to this land, but is very endangered because so many of the wetlands have been either plowed under or polluted. And she said, um, one of the reasons it's hard to find is that it, its flower head very rarely comes above the surface. So you need to be quite close to see it. And it's got very deep roots, right? It's a much more of a water lily that is hardly above to meet the sky and is mostly rooted in. So she said, I've been praying for about three years to meet this lily. And I've been praying. And she said, and on this day, not only have I met it, but beaver clearly pulled this lily out of what is otherwise quite difficult to pull out from the earth, pulled it, cleaned it, and left it on the path for me to find. And of course, she didn't have to make the obvious connect, but what I felt was I was like, oh my God, like she waited. You know, she didn't go 
wading through ponds to try and find each time impacting that ecosystem of that pond to find what was her material desire is that she prayed and she waited. Our kin have confused care and control as though they are the same thing. I don't know what it's like to live at the pace of the slowest among us, Shante. I'm too impatient sometimes because I want to go faster. I love talking with lots of ideas. And and then I end just by linking arms with you, knowing that you have things to teach me about the pauses and the listening. And I know there is no other way through. And I also know that because our kin have the capacity to leave agitation, because we can create spaces where we are safe, eat food that others suffer to make available to us. That we have to be in the awkward, longing for the slowness, for the pause, for the waiting but also not leaving our kin whose agitation is so high because of what our people have done. So we have to be in both for a while yet. And beyond that, I don't know anything more. Hi, you. My heart is wide open to you right now. I feel it. Thank you. Hi, sweet one. That feels like a really, really good place to close. Thank you for letting me both share and receive some stones. (laughs) You are welcome. Thank you. Thank you for all of the different ways of meeting. And yeah, yeah, they're like, <laughs> here goes the agitation again. <laughs>